Hello you, my name is Lauren Layfield and this is your next podcast. The show the podcast fans everywhere have been waiting for. Let's be honest, finding new shows to listen to can be one of modern life's little irritations. Don't want to make a big deal out of it, but a person can spend an unreasonable amount of time scrolling and searching. It can sometimes feel like there are too few needles and just too much haystack. So that's where I come in to help you find audio treasure. Every week, I'll bring you the first episode of a brand new podcast, which I have tried and tested, ready for you to get stuck into. Plus, if you follow your next podcast, more great suggestions will appear in your favorite podcast app, and you'll automatically create a fail-safe list of five-star shows to pick from, so no more scrolling. This week, the show I'm recommending is a series which won not one, but two awards at the British Podcast Awards at the end of last month. A Positive Life not only scooped gold in the best factual category, but it also won Podcast of the Year. An immense achievement, so hats off to the whole team. In this series, the host singer Sam Smith presents stories of HIV in the UK over the last 40 years. They hear from people who remember the earliest years of the AIDS crisis to grassroots activists through to a new generation living with effective treatments for HIV. It's a really moving, beautifully made and important story told really, really well. What would would happen is that you would see people in the clubs you say, oh, hi, and then two, three weeks later, you'd say, oh, I thought, you know, Jim or Joe was going to be here. I know he's dead. And it would be that fast, especially at the beginning. Uh, it was, yeah, it just, people would drop like flies. The first three episodes tell the story of Terry Higgins, a man whose name is very familiar. He was one of the first people to die of an AIDS-related illness in 1982. After he died, his closest friends set up the Terence Higgins Trust, which has gone on to become one of the longest-running HIV charities in the world. In this episode, we hear about Terry's life from some of his family and friends. Those are um, Linda's photos. Um... This is Rupert Whittaker. He's in his flat in Manchester, looking at some old photographs of a man called Terence Higgins. <laughs> so there's a very sort of bolshy looking um, young bloke in naval uniform, uh, one smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Rupert and Terry Higgins were boyfriends back in the very early 80s. And that was my favourite photo, where he's sitting in his flat where I used to go with his friend Linda. Terry's a slim white guy with dark hair, about 30-something, looking at the camera and holding a cat in his arms. He's got a a strong chin, a big moustache, and he's wearing one of his very typical undervests. This again is from, I think, from Linda. That's when he was known as Fat Terry. She knew him and he, he was a lot heavier than he, he was when I knew him. And this one above, you can see him there. It's a couple of weeks before he died. He's got his shirt off, it's in the summer. And uh, you can see he's very thin there. And he's lost a lot of weight. On July 4th, 1982, Terence Higgins became one of the first people to die of an AIDS-related illness in the United Kingdom. It was just under a month after he turned 37. No one had yet heard of the virus HIV, so people who'd acquired it in the previous few years had no idea it was in their bodies, slowly making them incredibly vulnerable to infections and illnesses. First in America in 1981, and then here in the UK in 1982, people suddenly started to die. What would would happen is that you would see people in the clubs, you say, oh, hi, and then two, three weeks later, you'd say, oh, I thought, you know, Jim or Joe was going to be here, I know he's dead. And it would be that fast, 
especially at the beginning. Uh, it was, yeah, it just people would drop like flies. Rupert knew that he was getting sicker too. I had this sense that, okay, I'm, I'm expected to be dead already. I am expected to die. I expect myself to die. Right, well, what do I do? Do I just sit around and wait for you know, this to happen? Or do I actually do something with the time I've got? Within just a few weeks of Terry's funeral, Rupert and a group of their friends got together. We had our very first meeting at Martin Butler's flat in Limehouse in East London. And um, we said, we've got to do something about this. At the beginning, it was called the Terry Higgins Trust. And then that was changed to the Terence Higgins Trust. We always knew that it was going to be named after Terry. I'm Sam Smith, and this is A Positive Life. Forty years after the Trust was founded, we are living in a different world. Today, if someone's diagnosed with HIV, they can start treatment almost immediately. And that treatment allows them to live a normal life. But when the epidemic started, we were years away from that breakthrough. And this epidemic is unusual, because for a long time the people being impacted by it had to manage pretty much on their own. The virus making people sick was showing up in particular groups more than others. It was always people who were already marginalised. So in the early 1980s, when those people started getting sick and dying, instead of asking how they could help, many saw it as a reason to stigmatise them even more. But the communities most affected by HIV didn't back down or give up. Instead, they started grassroots campaigns, found ways to share information with each other, and created networks of mutual aid. The reason that we have such effective treatment and drugs at the moment is partly due to patient activism in the 80s and the 90s and beyond. And that activism hasn't stopped. In the next eight episodes, we're going to meet some of the people who've been affected by HIV over the last 40 years. From the earliest years of the AIDS crisis. If you were diagnosed at that point in time, you would be told that you wouldn't live for long. To the mid-90s, when we finally had effective treatments. And all of the services had to change because suddenly we were in the business of helping people live. We'll be meeting people who know what it is to live with HIV in this new world, with all the challenges that still remain. Since this contaminated blood inquiry was announced in 2017 by Theresa May, 400 people have died. If people hear about somebody who's got HIV, they automatically want to moralise and they want to make judgments. And we'll be meeting people who are fighting to end the stigma around HIV once and for all. I very much wanted to sort of break the stereotypes beyond just how it's transmitted, but just like what people with HIV are like. It was really important to meet other people living with HIV, and there were really profound moments. There's no way I could ever have envisioned being part of a community that is as abundant and loving and vibrant as the community of people living with HIV. But the first thing we're going to do is meet someone who's not around to tell their own story. Terence Higgins. The Terence Higgins Trust is now one of the leading HIV charities in the world, running community projects, campaigns, and providing sexual health services like HIV testing. Terry's is a name lots of us know, but we don't usually get to hear anything about who he actually was. Terry became famous for how he died, but he also lived. Life was a great big adventure that he wanted to be in, he was the swashbuckler of life, he really was. I felt sorry for the people who didn't really get to know him because they would have had a great time with him. So in this episode, we're going right back to the beginning, before the HIV epidemic ever started, to try to find out who Terry was. 
It's a story that's never been told like this before. And it starts here. That's St Thomas Church. This is St Thomas Green. This used to be covered in fairground stuff twice a year. And We're in a place called Haverford West. It's a small town in South Wales, just a few miles from the coast, at the very western tip of the UK. This is where Terry Higgins grew up. Well, as you go through there, you're actually, like, standing on a stage, and then you go down some steps, and then you're on a wooden floor. That's it. And they used to hold dances there, and youth clubs, and all sorts of stuff yeah. when we were kids. This is where Terry used to dance. Yeah. Angela was friends with Terry back when he lived around here. She was born in a place called Merlin's Bridge, about a mile away from Haverford West. I have two daughters and a cat. <laughs> Angela's house is just down the road from Haverford West. She's travelled and lived in other places, but this is her hometown. I didn't start really going out until I was about 15, going on 16. And Terry was just somebody you saw on a Saturday night. We went to the local dance halls. And my friend and myself, he would say, come on girls, up you get. And he would drive with the two of us at the same time, using his right arm and his left arm to take us. And he'd spin us, he'd cross his hands over, he'd cross his hands back, he'd turn us the other way, and he was brilliant. I can see him coming down the high street now, and his trousers would be sort of flapping. He had this way of walking. He had a dancer's walk. You know how a dancer walks? They have that airiness about them, that floating movement. He had that. To me, he was just Terry. It was only when he died that I found out that he was gay. I would have thought it would have been dreadfully difficult because there was such a stigma attached. Still yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a totally different era, and young people today just have no sense nope. of that, I don't think. Not at all. They really don't. <laughs> when Elton John started out, it was illegal. Like, yeah. it's crazy. Well, I don't know when he married a woman. I know. I yeah, it's mad. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's true. <laughs> and Freddie. Yeah. Yeah, he was never out. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. This wasn't just a time where attitudes were different. In the 40s and 50s, when Terry was growing up, gay sex between men was illegal. You could be sent to prison for crimes like buggery and gross indecency if you slept with another man. And thousands of men were. These laws only began to change in 1967, and even then, only partially. Many types of sexual contact between men stayed illegal for a long time. So Terry started life here in Haverford West at a time when coming out as gay to friends or family could be an incredibly risky choice. As you go around the corner there, you see a house, something, keep going, and you'll come to a small car park. Mm. Walk through the car park, and you'll come to a big housing estate. Okay. And that's where he lived. That's where Priory Avenue is. So we're assuming odd numbers, 9, 11, 13. This is Robert Nisbet. He's a local historian that's lived in Haverford West on and off for the best part of 80 years. He met up with our assistant producer, Emma, to give her a bit of a tour around town. Together, they trekked down Terry's old house. So here's number 13, Priory Avenue, on the end of a short terrace of four houses. The house looks like a two or three bedroom. It's got a front lawn and a parking space and a path leading round to a back garden. There's a layer of dark green paint on the outside, but that looks like a recent change. 
My name is Billy Absley, Y-A-B-S-L-E-Y. I lived at 59 Proudly Avenue, top end of the avenue, and Terence lived in the bottom. And the reason I know this, I was the paper boy there for the Telegraph on a Wednesday, the Sunday, and I was on the back of a lorry delivering logs around the, uh, the estate. Bill remembers most of the neighbourhood kids from the time. We'd play down in a field, which was part of the council estate. Occasionally, Terry would come down to the field. I was, say, 10, and he was, say, 14. He wasn't really a mixer. Very rare, Terry came out. You'd never see him in the winter, but occasionally Terry would come down about 7 o'clock, and he'd be gone at 9. We were rough and ready kids, you know, cricket one minute and then football the next, then falling out the next and fighting. But Terry never got involved in any of that. He was a quiet boy, you know. I knew he was um, something, he was different. But like I said in there, we were children. We didn't know what that was. We didn't know how to treat people. And, you know, it's all different today. This was a time when boys were boys, girls were girls and absolutely none of them were gay. We would go to one of the chapel youth clubs at 16. We'd bring along records, the old 78s. We were actually pre-vinyl at that point. Uh, somebody bring a gramophone, somebody off to play, and we just danced there. So, what do you call elders or senior members, deacons of the chapel looking on? There was still the whole expectation. Uh, most boys would get there about 10, having been drinking, not to excess, they, they could still get there to dance. The girls were sat around the wall, uh, the word wallflowers sometimes unkindly used, sit there waiting, and there was this awful pause about 10 o'clock when somebody had to make the first move, cross the floor and ask a partner, and then it was relaxed, and then people would they'd go ask, and uh, so the thing flowed on. I can imagine a gay boy would just feel seriously left out all the sort of social functions that dance assume you're there, boys on this side of the room, girls on the other. If you felt differently, I can see you generally would have felt left out in some way. And it was kept quiet about. But I used to go to the market hall, which was a, like a big, massive room where they sold potatoes, Saturday chickens then, and they turned it into a, a, a dance room. Oh, I can remember him dancing. He was out of this world. See, we were like... Farmers in boats, and you know, when we danced. But he was light, like a, a ballerina, and his waist was like a woman. He could sway his body, and yet the likes of us all had beer bellies or useless, you know what I mean? He would play the piano. Here's Terry's friend Angela again. One of these people, they could sort of, they call it vamping. Right, where you're playing the melody with your right hand, but your left hand isn't doing an awful lot, it's just playing the chords. Going da, 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 da. He probably learnt like that by ear, and it takes a, a really good musician to do that sort of thing. He was very talented, and he became a grammar school boy. To get to grammar school, Terry had to take an entrance exam. It was part of the education system at the time, and it meant Terry's teachers must have thought he was smart. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm just um, made an appointment to find any records pertaining to Terry Higgins. I made an appointment oh. with Elliot. Elliot? Yeah, yeah. This is our assistant producer, Emma, again, at the archives in Pembrokeshire, where Terry grew up. We wanted to hunt down a bit more about Terry's school days to find out what he was like back then. Um, so this is uh, the admissions register for when Higgins was part of the Haverford West Grammar School. You can see here details, obviously, his name. Terence Lionel Seymour Higgins. He started this school in 1956 and left in 1960. We do have several school magazines of the, called the Haverfordian and there are mentions of Higgins in these. He was recognised for his academic achievements. Interestingly, we also have a photograph of him in this year when he would have been about 12. 
Looking yeah. very cute. Looking quite scared at the camera there. <laughs> Looking very serious. Yeah, most of the boys in, the, in this photograph seem to be distracted by something going off to their left. And just on a final sort of nice note, the school library mentions that he donated his books to the library. Books, magazines, and I believe stationery as well. The school was a boys' school, very strict, a uh, lot of beatings. Di Stevens grew up just outside Haverford West and remembers Terry from school. It seems like Terry, being a bit of a performer, didn't just help him stand out on the dance floor. Our French teacher, who was an old Irishman, complimented him on his ability in French. You know how kids are. Kids don't want to make a fool of themselves. And so they are reluctant to speak with a foreign accent and so on. So we probably learned French with a broad Pembrokeshire accent. Whereas I think that Terry actually did try to speak French with a French accent, but he had a reputation for being good French. I don't remember discussing being gay in the school. I don't recall any discussions of that sort, whatever. And I don't know how, how difficult it was for him had I, whether I was typical or not, been told then a friend was gay, I'd have been disconcerted, confused, not unsympathetic. This is our local historian, Robert, again. And certainly would have wanted to help in so on and try to understand and so on. Whether that was more widespread, who's to say? After finishing school, Terry left Haverford West and most of his friends lost contact with him. My mother died up there and we moved to the bottom of town. Bill... Terry's neighbour from Priory Avenue would just get snippets of news about his life. And then the next thing I knew, I heard Terence joined the Navy. We don't know whether Terry joined the Navy in a classic gay kid bid to get out of his hometown. But we do know he stayed in touch with his family after he moved away, at least while his mother was still alive. We would often get visits from Terry when he was in the Navy. Annie Oakley is Terry's first cousin. I actually live in Australia. I moved across when I was 18. I just thought he was so handsome because he had very dark hair. And I can remember seeing all those creases in his trousers, how they used to fold them over when they were in the Navy. I reckon my earliest memory, I was about eight. And that was when he came to visit us in Cardiff. And he was in the front garden with us. And I can just see him now in his sailor's uniform, swinging us around and letting us dance on his feet because he was always dancing. As far as Annie knows, Terry never came out to his family. But he didn't completely hide his life from them either. When I was about 14, I'd stayed at Auntie Margie's. That's Marjorie Phillips, Terry's mum. Terry was visiting and he had a friend and I it never occurred to me that, you know, he had sexual preferences. And she said, oh, can you take this cup of tea up to Terry and his friend? And I walked in the bedroom and there were these two males in bed, Terry and his friend. But it never, never affected me at all. I just said, here's a cup of tea. You're just, you know, oblivious. I knew that Terry came from, from Wales, from Haverford West. I never met any of his family apart from his mother. This is Linda Payan, a friend who knew Terry during his later years in London after he'd left the Navy. Linda was one of the few people who got to be around Terry in London and his hometown. He didn't talk about his family much. It it wasn't a thing with him at all. But she did go with him to Haverford West on a couple of occasions. His mother was... A female version of Terry. When I think about it, you could see they were, you know, mother and son. She was a very square woman and large lady. Great fun, similar humour to Terry. And she could be cutting and she'd knock you down if, you know, she felt she had to. He could be quite rude to her, but she'd be rude back to him. So they'd had that kind of relationship. It wasn't a really close mother and son deal but 
I think they enjoyed each other's company when they did meet. You could see the kindness in her. I remember once, he was with a chap called Mike at the time, Mike Jones. We were going to see his mother. We went to a club in Cardiff. Left the club about two o'clock. Linda drove herself, Terry, Mike and their other friend Rosa up the main road from Cardiff to Haverford West. It was 4am by the time they got to Terry's mum's. Poor woman, I mean, we got her up. She started making us potato croquettes. She was had a very kind streak. Get up at four o'clock in the morning and make us potato croquettes. What a woman. I believe she was very well respected in Haverford West. And did she know that he was gay? That's our producer, Arlie. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know that. If she did, and I imagine she did, she would have kept that silent, especially in Wales, you know, a different time. It wasn't an accepted thing. It was very taboo. So I would think she'd keep that very quiet if she did know. So when you were there together, it wasn't like a... It wasn't something that was freely acknowledged or... No, it wasn't. Even though he had his boyfriend there. Mike was there. It was overlooked. Nothing was said. When Terry's mum died, his cousin Annie had already left Wales and was living in Australia. She died in 1974, I think it was. And he came to Pembrokeshire. And as far as I know, he went to Auntie Margie's funeral. I do remember travelling down to Haverford West to be with Terry because I knew it was um, going to be a very emotional time. And my cousin said that he just came, emptied the whole house, took everything, and nobody really saw him again. He vanished for, for quite some time and then he contacted my mum when I was over there in 1977 and he and I had a really, really good chat on the phone and then I never spoke to him again. I came back to Australia and then the next thing, I heard that he'd passed away. Terry was one of so many young people who's grown up queer in a time or a place where that wasn't okay and who's headed out in search of somewhere to fit in. But it seems like whatever Terry was hiding of himself in Haverford West, there were some fundamental things about his personality that everyone got to see. The same traits his friends and family from Haverford West remember so fondly today are what his friends in London loved about him so much they founded a charity, the Terence Higgins Trust, after he died. My abiding memory of him is coming out of the hairdressers, walking across the castle square and seeing him coming down the high street. Bouncy, 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 bouncy. He said, where are you two going then? And I said, well, I'm getting married today. Oh, bloody hell, girl. So he takes us into the castle hotel and he bought me a brandy and port. No, I could drink in those days, you know. And he bought my friend her gin and it. And so, thanks to Terry, I was half an hour late getting to the church. I went to my wedding slightly tipsy. All his fault. Not my fault. All his fault. (laughs) That stuck in my memory because it was my wedding day. And that's the last memory I have of him. When I was 20, I went to live in Singapore. So I was there for three and a half years. And um, by the time I came back, I had a child. So your, your paths diverge, you know, you, you don't see these people anymore. And I had no idea he'd gone to London until he died. Terry passed away on the 4th of July, 1982 one of the first people in the UK 
to die from an AIDS-related illness. In those days, we were very innocent. And when I found out what Terry died from, I was quite shocked. Because I had no, no inkling, you know, because he was just Terry who you danced with on a Saturday night. He just had this air about him, you know, he, was, he wasn't repressed or anything like that. He just got on with life and he seemed to enjoy everything he did. And that grin, because by heck, he had a lovely smile. And, you know, I can see him grinning now. Lovely boy, absolutely lovely boy. You, you've read your history, you know what it was like for gays in those days. It was a no-no, you know? Do you understand what I mean? He wasn't free down here. I mean, the people he knew in London would know him better than anybody because, of course, they were the years where he was free. In the next part of the story, we'll be following Terry to London. I remember when I first met Terry very well. He said, I've got some people from work coming over for dinner. Could you pretend to be my wife? It was the era of disco music and countless gay clubs where you could dance till you dropped. He had this absolutely unique way of dancing. I used to call him Wiggle Legs. But there was a darkness coming too. It was in the gay newspaper. What looked like this was then gay cancer and pneumonia. The nurse mentioned that they were investigating this disease, but they didn't know what to give him. He collapsed in heaven. Within a few days, he was back out. And in fact, that Saturday night, he was back in the club. And that was the second time he collapsed. We didn't go back in there after that. A Positive Life is an Overcoat Media production for BBC Wales and BBC Sounds. It's presented by me, Sam Smith. The producer is Arlie Adlington, and the assistant producer is Emma Goswell. The executive producer is Stephen Rajam, with additional production by Nada Smilinic. If you've been affected by anything discussed in this podcast, check the show notes on BBC Sounds for links to sources of information and support. The whole series is so worth making time for. You can find it by searching for A Positive Life on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your podcasts. Once you've tapped follow for that show, don't forget to do the same for this show too, so you can always find your next podcast. All my recommendations from the whole series will also be on Podcast Rex at www.podcastrex.com. That is www.podcastrex.com. Thank you.